Okay, so going over NIS. Now there is an easy way to get this going. And I'm going to be doing this off the top of my head from memory. Uh, I don't do this one on a regular basis, but uh, it is a cool server. Uh, so one of the things we need to do first of all here is do a yum install. So first off we need to become root privileged. So I just did password there for my password. And then I'm just going to come in here and say yum. If I can type yum install. I got happy fingers, yum install here, and then I'm going to do yp serve. And it's throwing a fit because the update manager is running in the background, so we need to kill it. So I'm going to do kill space dash nine to kill it unconditionally, so no matter what it's doing. Um, and this happens all the time, so it locks it. Uh, this happens on Red Hat too. This is how you also solve it on Red Hat. Uh, and that's 5379 because you can see the PID number here or process ID right there. And so that, that's like an ID number, so you identify. Yeah, it th yeah, it, it throws up the error and tells you why. That's why I like to do my installs command line because graphically it doesn't show you anything. You have no idea what's going on. Huh? Uh, control C. Sorry, Control C lets you cancel a program that's running in the terminal like 99.9% .9 of the time. So if I do, right, do that right there, it's going to kill it. And I'm lazy, so I'm going to type it up. I'm just going to hit the up arrows here to get back to my previous command and make it run. Yeah, keep asking the questions, guys. That's good. <laughs> um, and I'm not thinking. Um, I'm not connected to the Internet. So, of course, it's not going to install. But I believe it's already installed on the system. So I don't think I have to worry about this uh, as far as that goes. Um, but that's what you would do if um, if it didn't like you. All right. Essentially, I'm going to go ahead and launch another terminal on another desktop here. I keep forgetting I'm not connected to the internet. So used to being connected to the internet when I'm doing this stuff. Su dash dash here. I'm going to do password again on another terminal. All right. So after that point, what you're going to do is slash sbin slash chk config space like that. And you're going to say the name of the server. In this case, it's going to be yp-serve space on like that. And you're going to say what? Uh, same thing. I'm too lazy to type that over and over again. So I'm just going to hit my up arrow. I'm going to do yp-pass wdd. The second D is for daemon. So we're saying yp for yellow pages. Yellow pages is another name for NIS or Network Information Service. Um, and then YP is yellow pages and then pass WD uh, for passwords and the last D is for daemon which means server. We're going to turn that one on and then the next one we need to turn on. So believe it or not when you turn when you install YP server you actually install three servers. Uh, the other one is going to be YP XFRD and a D is for daemon and again that turned it on and then when we start them we're only going to start two out of the three because uh, if you try to start uh, YP serve it will not work until everything's configured and there's a lot involved on configuring it but slash sbin slash uh, service here space uh, and then again YP uh, P A S S W D D space start to start it Again, I hit the up arrow because I'm not typing all that because I'm lazy. And then X, F, R, and the D there. And that started both of those. Now note, we did not start YP serve because again, we do not, uh, we cannot start it until it is a properly configured server. Okay. It will not start. You have to create your map files. Your map files mean databases. Maps is another name for a database. So you have to create your database files for it, so it can do its up, uh, so it can do its lookups. So lookups are on the database files are generated from your configuration files from etc. So things like the hosts file um, from your past wd file, your shadow file. Believe it or not, your past wd file does not actually contain passwords. It contains usernames. And your shadow file contains the actual passwords, which is kind of funny. Encrypted passwords, that is. Um, so they'll throw you off. Uh, but anyway, it's all these different ones uh, for all these different configuration files, including, but not limited, to your auto mounting, auto FS stuff uh, can also be included in there so they can pull that information up. 
um, and a bunch of other things as far as that goes. And then you can pass those on to all the clients so that when the client machines connect to the server, they can get all this information for a static lookup of all the different computers on the network uh, so they can connect to them by name or whatever if you like. Uh, you could also have it to where it gets the uh, user accounts. So that, again, this is where you have your passwd and your shadow files. They can log into their user from any machine on the network that's on Unix or Linux. So that covers you know most of them. Is that making sense? So this makes a whole lot of sense to have this up and going. Uh, the other one you'll need to install is yum install. And this one's really easy. So the YP server or NIS server is really complicated. And then the YP client or NIS client is really easy to configure. Uh, but anyways, yum install uh, YP bind. YP bind stands for the client. And again, of course, it would. Uh, but I don't want to actually install this because, again, I'm not connected to the Internet. And I keep forgetting about that. But um, here's where the uh, issue lies as soon as I can find my cursor so is this thing still thinking about doing it so here I'm just gonna kill this other process that's running on the other page because I want to get rid of that window anyways so kill dash nine it'll kill that process that's running on the other terminal <laughs> you can do that too by the way check it out it should kill this process over here and it did killed <laughs> So it can be useful. So if something locks up, by the way, terminal and kill it. It'll give you. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. Yep. So if you try, yeah, if it gets locked up on another terminal, there, you can go to another terminal, run the command again. It tells you what PID is running. Uh, you grab that PID number and you can kill it running on the other terminal. Uh, you can do that with any program. It doesn't have to be an install. As long as you just get the PID number, and if it's locked up on another place or terminal or whatever, you can kill it. Um, there's also a way to do it where you can just click on something and kill it. With basically, kill dash nine option from a uh, from your bar up here if you want, and you can graphically click and kill an application. If you uh, right click up here, uh, for instance, and you say add to panel, and you come down through here, uh, you see this force quit right here. If you select this one here and add it, then if I um, let's see, do I don't care if I kill you? I don't care. All right, so when I click this uh, little terminal here, it's going to die. So I'm going to click this right here. It's going to tell me that hey, I'm really set up to force quit something. If I click on it, I'm going to kill it. Basically, I'm doing a kill dash nine graphically. I click on it. It says, hey, do you really want to force quit quit this? And so I say yes. It's gone. So if a graphical program locks up and you don't want to even hunt down the PID number for it, you don't have to. Right click there, say add to panel, grab the force quit uh, special hot button here. Make sure you're careful with this program because it will kill anything. I think they stopped it to where you can no longer click on the desktop because back when you could and would kill your whole operate, your whole desktop. Uh, so don't do that. Um, uh, but back when, uh, I think they did allow you to do that and it's not a good thing. So. Uh, I did lose my other terminal, <laughs> so uh, let me launch my terminal again. Uh, but yeah, FYI. Apparently, I wasn't expecting it to kill all of them, but yeah, it killed all the terminals. I wasn't expecting that, but yeah, pretty much it killed all of instances of it. Um, so, but anyways, there you go. Um, is this making sense so far? on this right here. Now I'm going to show you the easy graphical way to do this on Webmin. Okay. Um, so let's do it that way. And then my other video, I'll just show it to you. And yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and go to my Webmin. Of course, it need to be root and password's password. Um, and I'm just going to go into my servers here real quick. I think it's in servers. Maybe not. Maybe under networking. It's under networking. Uh, NIS client and server. All right, so there's a, a nice little bug that was running in Red Hat back when they allowed you to do NIS. Now it doesn't even work at all, all together anymore. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's the problem still exists in CentOS, only worse probably. Um, and... Basically, the problem is is that they got something running underneath the hood where it will not set the daggone domain name for NIS. No matter if you use the domain name NIS domain name command to set it, 
if you go in and hand edit the file, it still doesn't update. You would have to literally restart the whole operating system to get it to update. Uh, it's a sub-process underneath the hood somewhere uh, that they have going on that's not resetting properly, and it's a bug in the operating system. And they have not fixed it for, like, I don't know, last maybe eight, nine versions of Fedora type thing, and CentOS is no different on this. So, I mean, it's been going on for quite a while. So, the way to do this is you need to first enable the NIS server. So, by default, it's set to no. You do want to enable it, okay? Otherwise, it's not going to work. So, you're going to check yes. Uh, this is a very complicated server, and I, uh, Webmin makes it super simple to set up, which I absolutely love. It just automatically has most of the configurations checked. You need a domain name here. So I've checked here uh, to set it to what I want to type it in as, and I say NIS. Why? Because I thought NIS domain name would make a lot of sense for doing NIS. It's just kind of intuitive, so I did it that way. You could name it anything you like, but I chose NIS because it makes sense. Note, if you do a capital NIS, it is case sensitive. You need to do a capital NIS for the client side for the domain also. Does that make sense? All right, so this is an old server. It's been around for a long time, and it works really good. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie type thing. And essentially, uh, they don't have um, the ability to, um, back when, do uh, multiple servers with clustering. This is like pre-clustering type stuff. So what they do is they have uh, basically your... Um, Oh, what's it called? You have your main servers and then your secondary servers, your primary and secondary servers. Uh, they referred to it back when, though, as master and slave servers. So your primary server would be your master server, right? And that's where you'd have all your configurations and everything on it. And then you could push all those configurations over to your slave servers or your secondary servers. When you did that, that's pretty cool because then you'd only have to configure one server, more or less, and it would update all your other servers. And then you'd have all your clients connect to your secondary servers, basically, and get their information from them. And you could keep the load off of your main server. Yes. Right, it's like a parent-child set up for servers, more or less. And so it allows you to basically have a multi-distributed network here of servers and handle many different networks simultaneously uh, hitting your uh, servers for your NIS. Does that make sense, everybody? So it's really cool, and it makes it nice because then you can just push your updates from your master server and then all your other servers update accordingly as they receive the updates. And then the clients automatically get updated across all the networks. So, <laughs> it's kind of cool. Of course, you don't go below 500. Why? Can anybody tell me? Right. The lowest user number you're allowed to have is 500 because below that is all the different servers and hard drives and stuff like that because they're actual users on the system. So yeah, 500 and up. They automatically put it in for us. We don't even have to think about it. It's there. Uh, we're not going to push to our slave servers because we don't have any. So this is just going to be just a master server. Now, if you did have secondary servers or slave servers, however you want to call it, on there, you would literally list them here, and you'd say yes to pushing to it. So that way, when you do updates on your master server, it would get pushed to your uh, secondary servers. Does that make sense? Uh, I think spaces think I don't I've really never had to use them before <laughs> to be honest I've only I've never had a network big enough for um, a local area network that was just Linux or just Unix like that to where I would need that many servers to handle the, the users I've just never had that big of a need for it you know what I mean uh, you'd have to have a, comp a big company that was on uh, where most of the users on the company were on Linux or Unix in order for this to be the case. So unless they all use Macs or something like that or whatever, or all happen to be on Linux for the work, which is not typical. Uh, it's very atypical. So chances of you running into that are pretty slim for the most part. Um, I've never run into it, to be honest. Um, also, you could do a DNS lookup. So you could also look up verification of whether or not something exists for address or whatnot through the DNS server, if you like. And that's where you check it there. But we're going to leave ours off to no, and we're going to do our own lookups, okay, through a host file. Uh, but instead of going through a host file, we could go through a DNS server to find something, too, through our DNS server that we set up. You're going to learn later on how to set up a DNS server 
uh, here uh, some weeks from now. Okay, we'll go. What's that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Etsy is another way of saying it. Yeah. <laughs> ETC Etsy. I've heard it said that way a lot of times too. Well, yeah. That works also. <laughs> Okay, we need to promote laziness as much as possible, so that works. Um, right here we have our file for Unix users here. So this is our... Now, you notice they just filled them all in for us. <laughs> yeah, for webmen. Normally, you'd have to do all this stuff and then some. And when I say do all this stuff, I mean it's way more complicated than you think here. Um, but essentially, you come in here to etc here and passwd file slash etc slash group slash etc uh, passwd dot adjunct here for user information. Uh, ethers is going to be all your Ethernet cards, things of that nature. You can set up for multiple Ethernet stuff. Uh, host file, your print cap for your printer setup or whatnot. You can also have your public keys for that. Uh, your services here for your network services and your net IDs. Uh, you have to generate that net ID file. I'll go over how to do that later. Uh, it is not set up for you. So there's a command that you can do to generate the file and then you can redirect that output that would normally go to the screen to the file called net ID that gets stored inside the ETC folder. I'll go over how to do that later on. Uh, here's your auto master for your auto mounting. Why not? Uh, here's your auto local for your local auto mounter. So this is really great because then you can just pass over. You know those NFS auto mounters or whatever? Check it out. You can add them. Yeah. Uh, here's your shadow. So this covers your passwords. G shadow for your group passwords. Aliases. Uh, boot parameters for booting. You can even set boot parameters for all the clients this way. Uh, networks for all the different network addresses. Uh, you also can have your protocols in here, your RPCs for your uh, internet connection, uh, for your network connections. As far as that goes, here's your net group for setting up different network groups. And then you also have um, for things like AMD Home and Auto Mounter Home for it here. And you could have additional ones besides that. But so you can see, just having this one setup like this, you can really have all your clients basically configured for the most part from the server. Does that make sense? Now, and every time a client connects, they just have all their stuff magically. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. And this lets us tie in directly with NFS, and it saves you a lot of problems. Because now, because you're doing your clients, because uh, you're doing your user server side, you never have to worry about Jill and Jack having two different user ID numbers on the clients versus the servers. And then when Jill logs in, she ends up becoming Jack. And when Jack logs in, he becomes Jill. And then he has access to her files, and she has access to his files. That's not good. You know what I mean? Into each other's accounts. That can happen when you're doing NFS, and you're not using something like NIS or LDAP. So because you don't have a centralized user system, you're literally, if you're doing NFS, you'd have to literally go on every single client machine and set up all the users for every single computer. And then make no typos in doing it. I mean, like you'd have to have totally spot on user IDs and group IDs all the way down the row. Never make a mistake. If you do it on a thousand machines, I think you're going to make a mistake eventually. With this, you only have to do it once on the server in one place and everybody gets it and everyone matches always. Does that make sense? So this allows someone to remotely log in on the network and have all their home files on the server and they don't even know it. So their account and their files are on the server the whole time and they think they're just on their machine and they're not. Does that make sense? So that's why they're setting up the auto mounting with the slash home. You would share that auto mounting home with NFS as an auto mounter. They go to log in. It gets uh, Then they log in. They get mounted for their home directory or whatever it is for their account. And bad being, they are in their account on the server side for their files. You want to run applications typically client side and not server side if they're heavy. Reason why is it'll suck your network traffic up like that, and you'll bring your network to its knees and nothing flat. So be careful with that. Make sure if you have any intensive applications, you run them client side. Keep your files, store your files server side for your storage, for your data, and all that stuff for you know files they need, you store that server side, but you run the intensive applications client side, because if you don't, it's going to kill your network like that. I've seen it happen more times than I want to count. Be aware of that. Google is making their apps run server side. Why? Because they're super light. They're just little web, web you know, HTML web pages, more or less, okay? So they can run their, their application server side because it doesn't cost them anything to do it. They're very light. So it does make sense to run application server side when they're light. 
But if they're heavy, you better run them client side. Otherwise, you're going to kill. Your costs are just going to do this. You're going to skyrocket really fast. And it doesn't take much to make it happen. So be aware of that. Anyways, once we're done with all this, oh, and also this lets you tell which ones you want to serve to the clients. So this is the information for what can be served and how, for what the information is. And this right here dictates what is actually served. Does that make sense? So only what is selected actually gets served. Does that make sense to everybody? So I wanted to point that out. So if you don't have these other ones here selected, it doesn't count. So on and so forth. Once you're done with it, though, you're going to say save and apply. And it's going to say great. And it did actually do a ton of freaking work. Once I show you, that thing just did probably 10 configuration files for you. And I mean, they're long ones, too. They're very in-depth. It takes a lot of stuff, okay? It just, it, I mean, it was bam. It also recompiled your database system, too, for you automatically underneath the hood. You didn't even see it happen. Generated the folders, generated all the map files, all that stuff. It did a ton of stuff just with that little click. I mean, this thing is, makes it at least 100 times easier with Webmin. No kidding. All right. After that, you would then go to your client here, which is going to be NIS and local host. Now, typically, when you're doing this, it's not going to work when I click Save and Apply. It probably will for me because I made it work previously. If everything goes okay, it'll do that. Now, if it takes much longer than that, it's not going to work. So, <laughs> let me show you what happens here. Uh, if it's working, a few things should occur, um, which it won't happen for you that way. Um, let's show you here how to access some of the stuff uh, in your book let's see if I can't point out to a particular page here where they have some information yeah yeah so page 775 or 775 on that page they have something of interest to you and uh, well they have a lot of information of interest to you um, the whole book goes over how to basically do NIS but however I have to point out that your server will never work based on the book it doesn't remotely have enough information required to make the actual server work on here. Uh, it's way too thin on information. So with that said, what I need to do, more or less, is and yeah, RPC info is great. I do like to do this. This lets you see what's happening. RPC info space dash p for process right here, and then do a vertical bar, and then you're gonna grab it like we did, you know, last quarter, and you're going to grab it for the process. In this case, we're going to do NIS because we want to know what's going on with NIS. Um, so, oh, I, I'm sorry, I need to say YP serve because we're talking about the YP server and not just NIS. So YP serve. Oh, I need to be root. I am root. You're right. I just did it. I just did it uh, last night on Red Hat. Maybe it doesn't work on CentOS? Oh, you know what? <laughs> no? All right, I don't know then. Um, I'm sure it's wanting the entire location to this. I really don't. Yeah. I don't know what its location is for this program then in this case because I figured it'd be an S spin but no doesn't look like it is. Um I'm oh, sorry. This does Um yeah, I tried bin which is just your regular uh system applications but if it's not in there those two then I really don't have a clue where it is. Um I'm used to typing RPC info. What's that? Uh, I might be able to It's probably dash. It's probably dash. You're probably right. Yeah. Right. So it's going to take a while. Um, hold on a second. Let me go ahead and launch another terminal while we wait for that to simmer. Um, okay. So anyways, besides that, um, there's another approach to this. 
And the main one I like about it, there's also a way to do this client side too for the bind. But the main thing I like about this is I need to first come in here. I need to stop my service process. All right. So slash sbin slash service right here. And I'm going to say yp serve here space. And I'm going to say stop. And it's going to stop that server. And now I need to start it. But I want to start it in debug mode so I can see what's happening for connectivity connections. And actually, if you run a client in debug mode and a server in debug mode, you get tons of info. Uh, so debug mode is awesome, and it's really nice. And the way to do it is come in here and say slash USR slash um, S, I think it's SBIN, slash uh, YP serve, slash dash dash debug, I think. Yep. Now your book doesn't say that exact address, but that is it right there for where it is. And you do need to put in an exact address, or otherwise it's not going to work. Now you're seeing it says connection from uh, 127.0.0, and it says .1, and an arrow OK. That's good. Why is that good? Because basically it's telling me that it did find the NIS uh, domain, and it is working. Uh, and the problem with the uh, one here is that uh, that doesn't typically happen. And so what you typically have happen is it can't find, it'll say, can't find NIS uh, domain. That's because, remember, we named our domain NIS all over case. Does that make sense? So that's what it can't find typically. For us, it's working out great, but normally it doesn't. When it doesn't work, you hit Control-C to kill it. Then you go back to uh, here. You go back to your NIS server, you set this again, set to NIS if it took it out, I don't think it does. Go here to enable, say yes, scroll down, hit save and apply again. Yep. And then you come back over here and try NIS client again and see if it takes. Bam, it should go like that. If it doesn't, rinse and repeat. Come back here again. <laughs> You may need to do this several times, like three to five times. You stop it because that starts up the server again for you automatically. So we have to stop it first. Then we can run our debug server again, everything. And so, you know, we need to see this. And we need we can do a test here. Um, and it didn't find squat. So <laughs> but anyways, in order to do our test here, uh, I need to do um, YP which. And YP which tells me which uh, server is, you know, is the domain on or for NIS here. And if everything is working connecting, as far as that part goes, for connecting to the domain, YP which is the first command you want to try. And that means you got past that problem or that part. So you are connecting to the NIS domain correctly when you get YP which comes back with this localhost.local domain in our case. If this was in a real scenario, it wouldn't be localhost.local domain. It would be like bacon server or something like that instead. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, all right. So it says okay. And then the next one is critical. And the next one, if it works, the one after it's going to work too. So if YP cat works, YP match will also work. If you have YP cat works, you're done. You're good. I only need to see three commands. I only want one screenshot for to show me that you got it working. Should be YP which command, the YP cat command, and the YP match command in a row. Take one screenshot of that. I'm good. Does that make sense, everybody? Because your stuff isn't going to work. Unless, I mean, your server doesn't work unless those commands are working. So I only need one screenshot of that right there. And then I know you have it working. Does that make sense to everybody? Period. YP cat for, remember, use the cat tool in order to display something. We're going to use YP cat to display the contents of the database map files from the server. So it connects to the server from the client, gets the information from the server, the server spits out that information from the database maps, and retrieves it to the client. I'll show you that. I can prove it. Huh? Match. YP match. It's going to be in the video too. Um, so if I do pass WD, remember that's the users. It's not actually passwords. That's the user file, right? Bam. There we go. So this lists all the users on the system. 
uh, as you can see. So for instance, we have our student here, uh, account, then colon, and this is a augmented one because actually, technically, um, you don't actually have uh, in the passwd file this password. Instead, it took the uh, it did a blending automatically where it grabbed the information from the shadow file and substituted it for the X inside of the passwd file. And so we're getting both files combined into one for the data for being pulled out of it, extracted out of it. So this is your um, encrypted password, which is password. So this is your password encrypted. Literally, the you know, P A P A S S W O R D. This is what it looks like encrypted in the encryption. Okay. Uh, this is your user ID right here. This is your group ID. This is your group. <laughs> this is your home directory right here. And this is what shell you're using. And it's all separated by colons. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, great. And then we can see some other ones like www-data, which we use for our Apache servers. So that way we have it blocked off from the rest of the network when someone uploads a file to the server. Uh, John Doe was another user I happen to have on there. So you can see John Doe set up here. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's fine. And Danny, you only have three of them more. But what if you had a thousand users on here? That would suck, right? That would just be a little bit difficult or just even hundreds would be difficult, right? So no, no, we got a special tool called YP Match for this. So YP Match is the next one that I want to do. And I'm going to say what user I want to do. So in this case, I'm going to do student. And I'm going to say passwd is the record I want to get. It. So I'm doing basically uh, a lookup by name for the uh, path, for the database map file by name. There's two different ones you have, by name and by user ID. Okay. So we're doing it by name. And so it does a database lookup by name. Why database lookup? Because it's really freaking fast. Okay. Because if you just said, oh, let's search through text files, whatever, that's slow, slow, slow. How much slower? It's about a thousand times slower than it is to do it from database. So this is way far more optimized. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's what I did do as a database file. So check it out. Instead of getting all the users, I only get one, and that's student, the one I asked for. Make sense to everybody? You have those three commands running like that. You get the responses back like that. Don't give me error ones. Error means you didn't get it working. Error means you don't get a full grade for this. You get a partial grade, maybe like a 50 type thing. You know. So make sure you get all of them working right get all those working you're good to go that is basically the server working and from a realistic standpoint if this was on a network however and the client connects up to it then they would get to access these users let me show you how to do that client side here in just a second uh, because I used to know what page off the top of my head it, uh, it was on but new book different page so not sure where it is right now uh, we'll look it up here in just a second but this means that your server is working and your client's able to connect to it properly and everything. There's only one thing you need to do in order to make the clients receive the uh, login to the server instead of getting their information from their local files on their system first. And you can set the order of which way they get their file information, all right? So we need to go over that here. So the way, what we need to do, I could look it up. I'm just going to tell you how it works because it's easier for me because I know it off the top of my head. I'm going to CD into my ETC folder. Now, you're not going to do this on the server. You would only do this on the client. Does that make sense? Because it does need to be the local files on the server. Why? Because you are the server. So you're not going to connect to a server to get your information because you are the server. So therefore, the server is the local files. Does that make sense to everybody? So files on the system. So I want to be very clear about that. Um, all right. So the one we need to do here, and I'm trying to get my brain to reboot here. The file I need, if I could just think for a second. As soon as I see it, I'll know it. What are you called? I'm trying to think. Uh, not resolve or solve is for the network connections. Uh, just having a where is it? It's 
sorry, just one second here. My brain just went blank on me right before I went. I do this all the time to myself. <laughs> NSSwitch.conf. Sitting there talking all about the file, and I can't remember what it's called after I start talking about it. All right, NSSwitch.conf. I knew I'd do it. Uh, anyways, nsswitch.comp file. So let me explain all about this file. I can't even remember the name of it because that's the way I am. Um, so you see a couple of options here, NIS plus, NIS with the plus after it, NIS or YP, another way of saying it. DNS files. Files means the local files, the files on your system. DB would be database. Compact method, I'm not getting into that. That is really complicated. So with special commands, basically it's an entire book. On how to do that. I'm not getting into that. Not even sure what this is. I've never even heard of it before. This seeing it on here. So I really honestly God don't know what it's for. Um but rest of them I do. Alright, so you see right here, if you were doing this, uh, I do say key. If you were doing this on the client, not on the server, off the client, you would say NIS right here, or you could say NIS plus if you're using NIS plus or type it out plus like that. Does that make sense? And by doing this, it's going to first check your NIS server, then check for the local files. And I'll go through in a better explanation of this real quick here. So, like that, for instance. All right. So, what does this mean? What's happening here? All right, so when it goes to look up the username, say the client comes in here, right, and you save this file out or whatever, and they come in here and they go to type into, so you need to set this up on all the clients like this for all the client machines. You would have to do this, like what I'm doing right now. So you get very good at messing with the NS switch file, believe me. <laughs> but anyways, you come in here and you set this up, and then the client goes to log in, right? Instead of finding the user on their local system, say Jack is on the local system as a user on there, and he's also on the server too and then you have NIS server running so if you don't set this up Jack goes log in he gets logged in only he's not on the server and he can't access all those files he has on the server does that make sense because he's on the local machine folder for his home directory and not on the server does that make sense to everybody so everything he does you're going to have to go back later on and transfer those files over to the server because they're not going to be there so you just create extra work for yourself. So it makes a lot of sense to do this right. Instead, if I do NIS here first, it's going to look for Jack on the server. If it finds Jack, it logs him in on the server and not on the local machine. Does that make sense? And then he's going to get his home folder from the server. Yes. So for some reason, if the server's down, if you're an IS server, he can still get into his account on the local machine, and then you have to move files over. But at least he's still working. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is a good setup here. In the case of hosts, remember that we can do a stack address lookup here, setup more or less. Uh, and here we're getting an entire table of addresses, IP addresses, on the server. So we basically do our static IP address listing here on the server, assign names to each one of the IP addresses, or whatever. And then when the clients connect, they get all these addresses. So this could be all the addresses to all the different servers on the network, for instance, or the client machines, or whatever, and you can have them by name or whatnot for your networking. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's really cool. Um, and then after that, you can have it try to do the lookup if it can't find it here on your local files. And if it can't find it there after that, you can have it try to look it up through your DNS server that you have on your network. As it, as it works with the resolve.com file for the resolver. I'm not getting into that. That's for another week, not today. Is this making sense, though? Okay. Besides that, there's other things, too. Ethers would be your Ethernet cards, uh, like ETH0, so ETH0, ETH1, ETH2, etc. Uh, net mass here, your networks, your protocols, your RPC, which is like your network connections, services, uh, net group, public key, net group is specific to NIS. Auto mounting, you can have it grab it from uh, auto mounting here, for mounting the stuff. Uh, also for aliases. 
And here's LDAP even for pseudo errors. You could also do it with uh, NIS if need be, but whatever. It's making sense. Um, in addition to that, you'll see something right here, not found equals returned. This is a more advanced setup. You can actually give it special options configurations and then change it from its normal functionality for the way in which it works. Usually you don't have to do this. This is very rare that you would need to do this, but you can do it if need be. And I'm going to see if... All right, so it's not where it normally is. <laughs> in the book for that file um, I was hoping but uh, because they have a nice layout or at least they used to have a nice layout in your book on this file and this file is actually on your final exam so the stuff I'm going over right now is on your final exam on this so I do highly recommend that um, Sarah is important. Um, let's see here. Real quick, let's see if we're lucky if they actually have it in here. Remember, service would be like what servers or serv services, what programs are run, like boot and whatnot, at boot time, etc., at the different run levels. So essentially, you can set that up for a client. Um, I don't know where they put it now. Uh, they used to have it listed in here. Yeah, this information's on blah 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 page. But um, I don't know if they do anymore. My apologies. Um, basically, we're looking for the NS switch file in the book for their write up on it. And they do have a, or at least they used to have a write up on it. And they've moved it. It's no longer on page 455. It used to be on 455 on the old book. And I'm not sure where they moved it to in the new book. Seven sixty one, really? Genie Christmas, okay. Uh, that's not the NIS switch. 494. Page 494 goes over it. Yes, that's it. So you can see a bunch of the stuff I just talked about. And this isn't as good of a write up as it used to be. But on page 496, gets into the information I was wanting you to see. Because this is the information. Um, I haven't talked about yet. I talked about all the other stuff. So you see status here. You'll see the not found one there on the right in front of you, but there's also one called success, try again, and unavailable. So literally, if I wanted to, I could come in here like this and I could say something, for instance, like uh, brackets here, not found equals return like so and then if it doesn't find it it returns before it ever even gets to files local files does that make sense so uh, like for instance the not uh, found method worked but the value being searched for was not found default action is to continue meaning continue on to the next thing which in this case would be local files but I can change that functionality and tell it to return in which case it would never get to local files and come back as a failed to find it does that make sense 
So that's one setup you could do. You could change on success. And you could do it based on success. For instance, the method worked and the value being searched for uh, was found. Uh, so no error was returned. The default action is to return. So basically when you find it, successfully and find it, it tip, by default it returns. You could do something really stupid and tell it to continue. So that after it finds it, it keeps looking for it. <laughs> like I said, you will rarely ever use this stuff that I'm showing you. Um, try again. <laughs> Uh, you could do something like return on try again. Um, so this method failed because it was temporarily unavailable. For example, a file uh, might be locked for a server overloaded. The default action is continue. Yep. Instead, I tell it to return. So basically, it doesn't end up trying again. It just ends up coming back and failing more or less. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to use return. I, I personally think the default actions make the most sense, so I don't ever mess with them. But, I mean, you could do it. Unavailable is the last one because there's only four of them. Unavail, like that. And the method failed because it permanently, because it is permanently unavailable. For example, the required file might not be accessible for the required server, uh, might be down, so the default action is continue. Now, so of course that makes sense to continue if it it's permanently down, so that you go to look for the next thing to see if you can't find that user on there or whatever or the information that you're looking for. Um, now, so the only two possibilities for for values here are either return or continue. Like I was putting in return and continue in here, that's the only two possible values with any of these four matching ones. And then you can also use a negation on it. So for instance, I could say a not here. So if it's not unavailable, what would not unavailable means? means it's available. So if it's available, return. Does that make sense? In which case then that does make sense to do it that way. So I could have done that not success equals you know continue or something like that. Does that make sense? Instead of success equals return. There's a default for six for success is return. So if we go in and there and we say not success equals continue. So if we didn't find it, continue on type thing, we could do some kind of action like that. Is this making sense to everybody? So that is the whole geeked out every crazy thing you can do with that file pretty much. Minus doing uh getting into the compact stuff. Compact method, I really don't want to get into it too much. It's where you can literally go into each individual file and edit whether or not a user in the actual password file or something like that in the passwd file is added from the server to the client machine on the fly or if the user is deleted or special characters to make it do other things I'm not even going to get into. There's a whole list of commands and special characters you can use with them. It is, I mean, tildes, pound signs, there's all kinds of stuff, at symbols. I'm not getting into it. All right, it is really complicated. You really need to know what you're doing on it, and you really need to have a book on it. And it is a good, like, 100 pages on that stuff, at least, for the compact method. I don't like the compact method. I think it's kind of messy. But if you want to be anal retentive, that is the method for you, um, without a doubt, because <laughs> you can really tighten it down. But that's how you can do the client. 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to be doing this right here. Oh, yes, files, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? For client. This is something that we're not going to do in our lab because we're not going to right. be client. Right. Right. You're only going to be the server. Now, I was acting as a client connected as to my server. But if I had two separate machines, I would do this. If I had two virtual machines running, I would do this on my client one only. Uh, I do have videos on how to do that and where I did actually make it work and everything. Uh, back when I recorded on my own home whatever but there no, there's no voice to explain anything so you might get confused this is gonna be a lot more straightforward because I'm actually explaining everything I'm going through and whatnot any questions on this no I'm not gonna require you to do that but I do want you to understand this what's going on if at home you do happen to have four cores on your machine 
and you could set this up as network, I would like for you guys to like at home for the heck of it, go in and actually make client and server connections on these different servers we're doing in class and actually connect them together and network them together on your VMware, running two different virtual machines together. Does that make sense? Uh, just because it gives you a more realistic scenario of having two separate computers connecting them. Just have your um, firewalls and your um, SE Linux turned off. And then later on, once you get it working, then try turning on your firewalls and see, you know, how that works. Does that make sense? Because I don't want you to try getting it set up with the firewalls on because the chances are you won't get it set up. Remember, on firewalls, the port has to be open client and server, not just one of them. Does that make sense? Because if you only have one open, you're not getting connected. And that messes with a lot of people, okay? So it's very important that you have it both ways. All right. With all that said, though, I'm going to mess things up if I don't uh, get it set back to just files. And I do not want to mess this up. So for that reason, I am going to remove my NIS. So you make sure, if you do happen to type it in while you're watching the video, make sure you remove this right here so you don't mess it up. So it doesn't go looking for an NIS server that's not there and never finds it. It's really not cool. Um, I'm just saying. Let me make sure I didn't put on anything else. I didn't. Okay, that's what I thought cool all right I saved it out so that is the ns ns switch dot comp file now I would like to read uh, direct your attention back over the page 700 and 770 hold on a second <laughs> 770 770, yeah. Um, <laughs> 770, 771. All right. So there's something called secure uh, nets file. Um, and if you look at it, so now because we set this up here, so check it out. I'm going to show you some of the stuff here. We're inside a var, right? Var is where all the servers are, right? So if I come in here and I go into var, I can go into uh, my YP. YP means our NIS, right? Pop in here like so. And we see different ones in here, including binding uh, YP servers, NIS. NIS is our domain. We'll look at that in just a second. Our make file, our nicknames, and our binding. All right. And this is where your secure nets file would be if you have one. If you don't have one, you would have to create it. And in my other video, I show literally how to create one from scratch. So Realize that not all the files are given to you for your server. They don't exist. You have to create them from scratch because they don't—they're not there at all. You have to make them. Does that make sense to everybody? Your secure net files. What it does is it determines what IP ranges are allowed to access the NIS server, and you can set up multiple ones. And I go over how to do that in my video on how to do that, and it essentially allows you to determine. Uh, who is allowed to access the server and who's not on the network based on the IP address ranges. So this group of computers here are allowed to access it and anyone outside the IP range is not allowed to access it type thing. Does that make sense? So you could have multiple I NIS servers and only the groups that are allowed to access that particular NIS server would be allowed to do so if your secure net set up for each NIS server. Is this making sense with everybody? Okay, good. Nicknames. Nicknames are like this. So the passwd file corresponds with the passwd dot by name, where we're doing the lookup of the database map by the name. We just did that earlier when we did yp uh, uh, cat space. I'm sorry, yp match space student space passwd. We were looking up our passwd entry based on the name and the name in that case was student. Does it make sense? Instead I could have done 500 because that is the user ID number for student and I could have looked it up by ID instead of by name. Does that make sense? We have two totally different database maps depending on which lookup it is where it's indexed to run super fast for the lookups on the two. So this way, the reason I do this is because you have lots of computers hitting that one server or whatever, and you want to do these lookups really fast for the information. So that way you're serving it really, really quick. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that's what's going on there. Here's group by name where we look it up by the group name. 
for a database map. We also have uh, networks here um, by adder. Adder means address. So we're going to look up the networks by their address. Hosts by their name, because remember we can give a host a name like Bacon Server, for instance. You know, that corresponds to an IP address. Of course, adder would be the ad address for instead. Protocols by number. Services by name. Uh, mail by aliases. So yeah, you can have different ma mail aliases here. And then ethers by name, etc. Now you can have a lot more than this, but this is just a short list. Matter of fact, these are only the ones we selected inside of Webmin when we were saying which ones we wanted to include. And that's the ones that are here. If we had selected all of them, this would be a much longer list, but at least twice as long. Does that make sense? So that is your nicknames file. All right, let's have a look at real quick our YP serves file. So if I say cat YP servers, we get nothing. And typically we only list the address. Uh, basically, I'll, it's in my other video where I set it up, wherever by hand. You only have the address listed for the server. That's it. So it's not there's not much to this file. Um, the main ones of interest here are going to be like your make file, and this one's going to be a lot of stuff. All right, so this is your make file. Sorry, and Webmin did all this for us. Literally, let's break this down. How this works, some. Uh, merge password true. This is what I was talking about earlier when we had the passwd file and the shadow file. Should we merge that merge the information where the X is there? Uh, normally because it usually goes what username and then X. X is a stand-in for the password. Well, with this set to merge password true, it's going to take your shadow password data in there and then input that where the X was. So when I did the command, let me show you. So basically when I do the command here, like YP match. All right, let me let me prove this to you. Let's just do this, all right? I'm going to cat etc slash uh, passwd, all right? So we see that file real quick. Bam, there it is. Check it out. Here is x. That's a stand-in for where the password goes, but they don't put the password in for security reasons. Does that make sense to everybody? So what we're saying is here's the passwd file, but we want the password to be inserted where the x is. That's what that true option does. So in doing so, when I run with that true option, which we do have set, and it is configured in our server, so this is what happens when you have this set up properly. Now I do a lookup by name on that address map, whatever, for that database uh, lookup, and I'm going to say passwd file. I don't get straight up the passwd file from the entries. Instead, check it up. For student, I actually get where that X is, the encrypted password. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what true means for the option in the file. Now that was inside of Webmin. No, because it's going to get encrypted again. So when it re-encrypts, they're going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Uh, but yeah, it's either being encrypted when it shows it to them, so they're not actually getting the real password, and that's why they leave them encrypted. Uh, and so, therefore, when they try to uh, input that in as a password, it's not going to work because it's going to re encrypt it. Yeah, it's going to get salted and re encrypted and all that stuff. So, when you salt it and re encrypt it, it's going to totally be garbled and messed up yeah yeah well what salting yeah. oh sorry salting uh, let's the one it's a really great method for um, dealing with people who don't make good passwords um, it's how you get around the fact that people like to use dictionary words for their daggone passwords and then any little hacker with a dictionary pass cracker can just run their little program and break right into their account in like seconds literally like in under a minute type thing they, they're into their <laughs> into their account so the deal with those people since these are your typically uh, computer unsavvy people but are like oh let's put doghouse for the password 
You know, all right, so now they're in their account like that. I don't know why I got hacked. I don't understand why I keep getting hacked. Yeah. Um, so basically what you do is you add stuff like dollar sign WXZB2543, uh, you know, exclamation mark, pound sign, blah, blah, blah to it. That's your salt. So every time they put in a stupid password like that, you add to it the salt to it. And then you encrypt it. And by doing so, when the hacker tries to go in and do it or whatever, they don't have the salt added to it. Salting it is adding that, what I just said. Uh, well, you develop it. You code your own, more or less. You code your own for the access panel for it or whatever. So that adds the salt to it before it encrypts the password and passes it to the database for the verification of the password. If you're not using a strong password, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, it's not a good idea. But hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so that's what salting is, more or less. You have a complicated, difficult crack string that you add to other people's passwords in order to make them secure because people won't make secure passwords. So deal with people who don't make secure passwords. Yeah, so the hacker has no idea what it is. And then it gets encrypted. And you can encrypt it multiple ways, too. You can do like MD5 with SHA1, for instance. SHA1 is harder to decrypt than MD5. Run both in a different order or whatever. So then it gets encrypted and then re-encrypted. And then it, yeah. anyways. <laughs> you could... That's good. That's good. Yeah, I mean, you got to have a lot of stuff like that. Um, on my websites, I also do an IP address verification, meaning that if you're not the person that logged in when, I, when you sent your password, whatever, to me, and your IP address doesn't match the one I grabbed from you when I hit my server against you, then I don't allow you in because you're a hacker trying to do a man-in-the-middle attack, and I log you automatically and report you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you are who you're supposed to be. That's good. That is a good thing. That's good. I mean, they have to, man. You gotta understand. There's people that are trying to hack into it, especially other countries. Um, it's the only legal way to do it. Um, so if you have over here, uh, here's the command for using awk for uh, parsing files as database, uh, basically files. Uh, so slash bin slash awk. Here's the make. Uh, we in order to generate these database uh, maps, we actually use the make compiling system. Uh, so that's what this make file is. We could develop a whole different one, but we didn't need to. Instead, we just used the whole typical compiling system we use for compiling object oriented C or C plus plus C plus plus basically uh, programs inside of Linux, and we use it for actually compiling down and generating those database files, uh, maps, if you will. Uh, and then here's our umask being set right here. It's 066. Yes, sir. Uh, awk could probably be at least a five-hour discussion, so I don't know how much we're going to be able to go into awk in any kind of depth. I got more material than I can cover, literally, for this course. And at this point, we've had the amount of material increased with um, what we have to do here with Fedora and whatnot. So, awk. Um, okay. So, awk is good. Awk is like more advanced than sed. Sed is like, you know, like we're doing VIM and with uh, go in and you edit a file. Sed does that, but through command line, and you don't even go into the file. Instead, it goes through and can find and replace everything you want it to based on some condition you give it to sed. Awk is taking that on steroids. Awk instead, um, like for instance, um, the cat file here. Um, the cat file, uh, when I catted the passwd file, is all separated by colons, right? Well, there's no reason why, awk works in tabs, so there's no reason why you couldn't cut 
that uh, use a cut command to separate the uh, colons in that file and then replace it with tabs and then pass that over to an awk command and then process it like a database table and you can even have if conditions or for loops and stuff like that inside your awk condition so you can do an entire programming string more or less like a little program inside of awk it's that powerful and you can do crazy stuff inside of awk for uh, basically reworking and reprocessing information and data. So it basically takes a standard text file and treats it like a database table record. A database table with every line in the file as a record. But the key is in order for it to work it must be spaced out by tabs so therefore you have to use things like cut and stuff like that in order to change what your delimiter is aka the colon or a space or a tab or whatever your delimiter for awk must be a tab so therefore if in this case it's a colon inside of the passwd file you would need to convert those colons to tabs does that make sense i know i know i it's that's why uh, hopefully you had me on the first class so that <laughs> you're not going oh my gosh <laughs> right now uh, if you didn't I feel sorry for you right now I really do um, <laughs> you're crying I understand that's why I put those intro videos up there for you guys to go through uh, if you didn't have me because you really need to know the basic shell commands uh, and, and you don't want to go like I told everyone I don't have time to go over that stuff when you get to the advanced class because there's so much material I don't begin to have time you know so you're gonna to have to hit those shell commands up uh, and go over the stuff uh, but anyways if I'm in here here's the location now this is really smart and I want to show you do we do this in programming all the time from when we're writing one of these configuration files and such this is awesome and so this is really really cool uh, basically what this is is uh, variables now remember we did our shell programming in our first class right we'd create variables we could assign stuff to it so this is basically a shell script that is what a make file is, is the shell script for how to compile these code files into a program. That is what a make file is, right? So the shell scripts, learning how to make shell scripts last quarter, here you go. Here's the application of it. All right. So YP here is your yellow pages or your NIS. SRC, which should be your source directory, and then DIR is the directory, and it equals ETC. Makes sense, right? That's where all your configuration files are. It's already set to etc. And then yp passwd directory. So where's the password file for that going to be for your configuration file? Well, it's going to be inside of etc, right? We're setting it there. And then yp bin dir or the binary for running yp. Where is it stored? Slash usr slash lib slash yp. That's where the executable is for the uh, server to run these things. That's where it's stored. Now, I want to point this out. If this is a 64-bit system on Red Hat and probably CentOS 2, this will be slash USR slash lib64 slash YP. And it will break standardization with, uh, in a, with Webmin, in which case you need to then go into the folder slash USR slash lib and put a symbolic link with the ln space dash s command and link it to slash lib64 in its place or whatnot. Uh, so that it goes to the uh, slash usr slash lib slash yp instead. I mean, I'm sorry, go, instead of going to slash usr slash, yeah, instead of going to slash usr slash uh, lib slash yp, you're going to create a symbolic link as yp to point over to slash usr slash lib64 slash yp. What's your question? No, because no, 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 no. This is server. It's a server where you don't do compiling the maps unless you're on the server because we're generating the actual database files. So this is purely server here. Okay, like I said, server's way more complicated. I'm oh, sorry. Let me go into um, I apologize real quick. Let me go into here to Vimit real quick. Make file so that way we can access it. It'll colorize it too for us, which is nice. Um, all right. So if I'm coming down here and I'm just let me point this out a little bit better here because this is something that really pops up. It's a heck of a headache. Uh, but if you are doing this and you have a 64-bit one, this isn't going to work. So what you literally have to do is come into this one right here and set this to lib64 like that. All right, because it changes the address to it. Because the 64 ones go into the lib64 instead. Now, the problem is the webmin's not going to find it there. So webmin, you're going to have to do like an ln-s, like something like that, slash, and you have to say usr slash lib slash yp, and then you have to say slash usr 
slash lib64 slash yp. So that way when it goes to look for it in slash lib yp, which is the 32-bit one, which is what it's set to by standard by default, it actually points it over to the 64-bit one, so it's a symbolic link. Does that make sense? So then it makes it work. So every time Webman goes to make a request to their standard location, YP1, it automatically gets redirected to the 64-bit one, and then everything works fine. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, most of you are going, oh, my dear God. Um, yeah, so you're loving Webman already, right? Because it did all this crap for you. Um, YPS bin DIR. Uh, so here you have YP here. This is your super user bin binary. So slash USR slash S bin. That's of course makes sense. That's where it is. YP DIR equals var, slash var slash YP. So this is your uh, YP server uh, directory here, which makes sense. That's where we are currently right now. Yeah, parent directory. And then you have YP map DIR. This is where your database files are going to be. So this is going to be based off of your YP DIR, which is this one right here. And then slash whatever your domain is. In our case, NIS. So remember that folder NIS in there a second ago? That's where it created it. That's where it created it. So that's what that's getting set to. So check it out. We didn't even fill in the value, and it automatically filled it in for us based on our variables by referencing those variables. So this is cool. Just by setting a few of these variables, check it out, because we're using referencing. Look at this, group, pass, blah, blah, blah. We got all these for their locations. If we need to change them, we update one, it updates all these others. Does that make sense? And that's what's done for us. So, you know, again, we've got a great deal here where um, having this set like this really makes life a lot easier. And then we get into the actual make file. So all this stuff is set based on those variables above, and it just makes life so much easier. Um, this is your make file. I don't want to really get into this stuff too much. If equal dollar sign shell slash bin slash domain name blah 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 none and then at echo here. Of course we know what echo does. Domain cannot be you know none etc. So it gets off that error message, so on and so forth. Uh, so it's basically checking to see if the domain is set to none or not. And we're going to run this as a shell command shell prompt this and then it says if equal to. No, so if it's equal to none when we run this in the shell, blah, 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 then kick out this error message. I'm not going to get into a lot of stuff. Of course, we know test. Instead of using the brackets, we're using the test instead. Um, dash D, remember that checks for a directory, so on and so forth. Uh, if not, we need to make a directory and mkdir, blah, blah, blah. CD into it, no push, make files here. We're using the dash F option for checking that stuff for a file, etc. So we're checking to see if those files exist. Et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and this all one is really important. I covered this in my video. You have to have all the map maps you're going to compile in here, and you have to know what they are. And since they don't have them pounded out or whatever, you literally have to know what they are off the top of your head. Unless you have a book on it, you're not going to know. I cover it in my other video where it literally lays all those out. And it's probably about a good two or three lines long. It only compiles the ones that are listed here and nothing else. So even if you have all this stuff configured out, even if you have them all listed and all this stuff, it won't make them unless they are listed here. It, yeah, yeah, but I'm telling you, uh, maybe, you know, even, I'm just letting you know, if that thing is not set to on all here for all the ones you want to compile in here and you don't have it listed, it ain't going to work, okay? I want to be very clear about that. So uh, those maps will not be compiled, and it will drive you freaking nuts, and that's what's going on here. And you no, know, it's not in the configuration file, and yes, you do have to know it off the top of your head, uh, unless, you know, you, I have my video which tells you how to do it, and I have all of them listed in there. I had to like figure it out without my book because my book was in storage at the time. It sucked. Um, all right, here's your make uh, net ID. This is a special command uh, that makes the uh, net ID file. I'm not gonna get well. Okay, so you would do something like uh, dash d for domain dash uh, p for pass wd for password, and uh, I, I covered my video. Just go check it out. It's in there how to do it and then how to redirect it and all that's in my other video. Uh, here's our ethers. So check it out. We look up our ethers by either by name or by adder or address, so on and so forth. So this lets you tell it how we're going to compile our database files and how we're going to do our lookups for them. Does that make sense? So are we going to look it up by address? We're going to look it up by name? How we're going to look it up? And this compiles, basically compiles all, all the different database uh, map files. And then in doing so, it creates all the different tables. So depending on how you need to look up information, it looks it up in that way. So it's optimized and it's really fast and all this stuff. Uh, and then here we get in here's your example of your awk. 
You want an example of awk? Here's awk right here. If dollar sign, dollar sign, one, remember what one is? Yeah, first parameter, not equal to, and quotes here, just nothing at all. And dollar sign, dollar sign, one here, not equal to tilde, which would be home directory and pound, et cetera. Print this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how you do it. Slash cheese mean tab, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's awk. That's an example of it. Yeah, exactly. That's so what I said. I'm not really probably going to go into depth on awk. It take five hours at least for me to go over uh, videos. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, so um, they do have a question about awk on the final exam, but it's very simple. Basically, what is it used for? And nothing beyond any deeper than that. Um, but yeah, I think it's something you should know and learn. Uh, there's very little detail on the stuff. Um, <laughs> it's hard finding any books where people, not very many people know a lot of this information, quite frankly. Um, so anyways, it's going through and it's building out. So these are each one of these commands is how to generate each database map. Okay, in here, based on the information for how to compile it. So that's breaking it down here, okay? And it's going through, it's merging them. That's how it does the merge operation. I never want you to edit anything down in here. All right, you have to really know what you're doing, and I'm afraid a lot of you would have no clue, especially when you get to stuff like this. There's the one for home. Um, you know, substring, what's the length of the substring? But I don't want to get, you know, so, you know, you really need to know your stuff, and I don't want you messing with this. This should already be there for you, type thing. So that's the make file. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me go to the top here. Yeah, leave it up there like that. Thank you. Yeah, that would really mess things up. Then be like, what the heck? Oh, that'd be frustrating. All right, let's have a look real quick here at the top. All right, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I deleted the line. <laughs> Forgot to change this again. I for edit. Delete that 64. Hit Escape key. Shift Z Z to save. All right. So with that, there we are with the make file. Now check it out. Um, if I CD into my uh, NIS, bam, there's all my database files that were generated. So that's all my database maps for the information are stored. And it updates those files to that whole process. So you want to update these records or whatever, you have to recompile the database. How do you do that? Well, that's actually covered in your book <laughs> on page. Oh, here's a good example of your secure nets on page 772. Uh, right there, you see it says cat slash var slash yp slash secure nets. See how they put in the different IP addresses? Now, since they did a broadcast of 255.255.255.255 in the space 127.0.0.1, whatever, that means it's only going to work on address 127.0.0.1 and no other IP address range. Does that make sense? So that limits it just to that one address. However, if I want to do something different, uh, let me give you an example. Say I did 255.255.255.0, and then I did 192.168.14.0. This would cover a whole list range of 0 to 254 addresses. I don't say 255 because that's broadcast, but you know what I'm saying. Right. Exactly. Does that make sense? So whatever your broadcast, and then 255.255.255.192 is going to be a limiting on uh, what the address range is on that. So maybe like what, 255 uh, minus 192, whatever that should be your address, minus the broadcast address range. Yeah. Uh, so that should give you something of that nature there. Um, but essentially that's how that works. Uh, showed you the make file. I went over it already. Um, and then... Yeah, the YP serve file, I've got to show you that still. And um, so I'm going to do that in just a second here. But before I do that, how to actually make or create those map files from the listing here, which is really cool. Oh, cool, awesome. They finally put it in there. On page 773, if you look down here at the bottom with the all colon, remember I was talking about those other maps, those other uh, maps you want to compile or create or whatever that were left out? Check it out where they have it pound pound signs in front of it. There's your other ones listed right here in the book. The, before this book, they never actually had those listed. Now they do, which is great because they never have them in the configuration file. You just have to know them off the top of your head. So they are listed right there in your book, which is awesome. Uh, that would be page 773 at the bottom. 
see that and that goes into your uh, make file so that's really particularly important for that all because remember any of them that aren't listed there are not going to actually be made into database map files so that matters a lot um, all right, so on page 774, that go over, goes over how to actually compile these database, uh, how to compile, takes that make file, it goes through the make file with this program, and actually generates those database maps. And that is done by typing in slash USR slash lib. So essentially at the command line here, you say slash USR slash lib slash YP slash YP init. Boy, I really need to type better init dash m m is master s would be slave so if you're doing a secondary server it's going to be a dash s if you're doing your primary server it's going to be a dash m for master you say that right there and it's going to run now on a 64-bit system it's going to be 64 instead of lib right there it's going to be lib 64 so make sure you put that 64 if you're on a 64-bit system that's why another reason why we want to stay on the 32-bit for some of the stuff because it does make some things go non-standard on some of the servers because of that uh, for the locations of things and whatnot but anyways um, you would go down there and ask you what host you want to add uh, these hosts are your uh, slave servers so remember we we're saying push to slaves and you could list them or whatnot here's where you would do it at command line and you literally type them in and then control D lets you say okay I'm done adding servers to it for my secondary servers then it says okay and it runs through and it says is this correct and you say, for which ones are gonna be your secondary servers you say yes to it and then it goes through and it compiles all those maps and you hope to god it goes through and compiles them all because if it doesn't you have to go back through that wonderful make file and all your configuration files and find out what the problem is if you're not using webmin you make one single mistake it will not work sucks so <laughs> kind of important and there's some more configuration files I haven't showed you that would also have to be done in here one of which uh, webmin does all this for you yeah. but if you didn't have webmin if you had like the Fedora thing where they went non-standard you'd have to do all this by hand like I'm showing you actually there's more than what I'm showing you this isn't all of it this is some of it um, basically uh, check it out if we do VIM here real quick last thing I'm going over VIM here and we're saying um, etc slash here yp serve dot conf you can see why I'm upset that they changed all the servers because there's a lot of information and then change all the servers is a big deal so I'm mad um, <laughs> it takes a while to learn all this um, DNS here set to no files 30 blah 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 so this is the actual configuration file for the server now something I want to point out here, you see these stars like this? This means, you know, all possibilities. And you can limit it if you like here or not. Uh, but you can actually put IP addresses and IP address ranges in here and actually lock it down to a particular one if you like on that. And that's how you do it right there. Um, we're not going to bother it. We're not going to do that, though. And then you'd also have the next rules and all this stuff. I have done that. I do go over how to do it in the other one. 30 files. Basically, you don't need to change any of this. Um, it's happy go you're fine on this uh, but if you did have problems you'd have to go in here and change it uh, and there's a little bit more stuff like setting NIS domain where you literally type in NIS domain name that doesn't really work and in our case we've been NIS that's how you set it this is temporary the moment you reboot the computer it doesn't exist so you actually have to go into the actual configuration file and edit it and save it otherwise it's not good to go forever and ever again okay webmin does this automatically for you um, because of this problem here where you're setting it with Red Hat or whatever, it sets it, but it doesn't actually go live. It doesn't actually work. So you put in this command. It tells you it works, but it doesn't actually work. So what you have to do in Red Hat, if you're not using Webmin, is basically restart or send OS here. After you're done, you go in the configuration file and actually set your domain name in the configuration file. You have to restart the computer, the server, the whole thing. And I don't mean restart YP serve. No, I mean the entire computer. Because there's something underneath the hood in there. I don't know what it is they have running that's preventing it from happening. And even Webman you know, bumps his head against it. And they bang heads. So, um, And that's essentially why you have to keep hitting that save and apply over and over again inside of Webman because of that problem I just mentioned with the NIS domain name. And that is why your server doesn't work right off the f bat. It's configured correctly. It just doesn't work. And it's some kind of bug inside of Red Hat and CineOS. Any questions? Usually stun silence is the typical response on this one. Um, so that's not everything. The rest of some of the stuff is actually covered 
in the other video where I'm scrolling through stuff and whatnot. Um, I do go into some of the other files like secure nets, uh, how to make the net ID file, and all that stuff in the other video. And you're free to just download it and check it out. Uh, I do have the command. I can't remember the command for the make ID. I haven't done it in like over a couple of years, uh, but it actually generates all that information so for you. Um, but essentially, that is it's a really cool server because it does get all your uh, configuration information inside your ETC and serve it up as a server to your clients so that your clients can make use of that information. On the computers. Make sense to everybody? Okay. Yeah. So thankfully, the earlier part of the video was your actual lab. Once I got to the make uh, YP match or whatever, that was it for your lab. So once you got those three commands working, you take a screenshot of that and you turn that in, and that's it. That's all I want from you. Yeah. Yeah. So the rest of it was for your edification so that you understand what's going on, what, how NIS works, and what's happening, and what's going on underneath the hood. Just, yeah. Yeah. This video I'm doing right now. Yeah. Make sense to everybody? Everybody's like, thank God. <laughs> it's all in the video. <laughs> I'm not going to remember any of that. Yeah, I know. Um, and so we have one like this. This is a standard server on Linux. You know, They are all this complicated. And um, so we're going to do one of these a week. Sometimes they're asking me to – actually, I was supposed to cover this plus LDAP today. No way. I can't do it. It's freaking impossible. I cannot do it. <laughs> okay, so if you thought this was bad, I was actually supposed to cover double this, and, and I can't do it. I, I, I physically cannot cover that much information. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to do LDAP another day. <laughs> uh, 